international space community, but because of NASA's policy on, you know, uh, limiting exchange with China, uh, they're outside that community. And so I, I guess one possibility would be to say, let, let's bring China into the fold a little bit more. Congress is not crazy about that idea. Is that a sort of avenue that you would support? Because I, it's kind of in, in step with the idea of I think realistically, ITAR. I think there are two, two situations realistically here. I, I think, first of all, there's a vacuum going on. America has caused a vacuum by its inability to get to station, for example. Okay, so there's a vacuum in transportation. Russia has stepped into that vacuum to supply that transportation. From a leadership standpoint, though, it's really in question right now as to is America uh, really in the leadership position? Where, where are we if we're going out three or even five years from now? Where, what are we doing that indisputably uh, validates that we are the leader? So I think there's a vacuum going on. That's the TBD situation here. Mm -hmm. Even besides Twittering, right? What? I said you mean besides Twitter, right? Besides Twitter, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, we have the social networks, and that's our ace in the hole against China. <laughs> right. The other thing is, I'm not sure China really would care. I think China wants to be the leader. I don't think it's a matter of that, well, China's saying, gee, um, we lose a lot of sleep at night worrying whether or not we're going to be part of the family. Let us into the clubhouse. I say, yeah. we cre they're saying, mm -hmm. I think, let's create the family and let other people be part of us. Um, question, uh, uh, the Chinese program has been, uh, particularly the human program, has been moving rather slowly. I, I think their last human launch was two and a half or three years ago, and it's taken them about three years to launch a very small uh, space station module. Do you see that as accelerating in the next decade? I think they're on schedule. Okay. Right, look, Chang'e 3 is going to be in 2013, they mm -hmm. say, and un uh, as opposed to the Americans, China has, I believe, pretty much performed on the dates, uh, time frames, if not earlier, um, than people expected. The stealth fighter bomber was a big surprise. We didn't believe it. We didn't believe that. Mm -hmm. It was a big surprise. Um, back in the 60s, when they first uh, were able to develop uh, thermonuclear warheads, that was a big surprise. That caught everybody. They did that earlier than we expected. So I think China has an ability to focus, galvanize their programs because of the centralization of their government and essentially dictate what people are going to do and what the overall government is going to do. And that's a, that's a real strong asset to be able to do that. So I think the result is they have a lot of things on their plate at the same time here. They're growing so fast. And, and uh, um, I think that from a prestige standpoint, I think you, you have to separate military activities from the prestige and, and uh, commercial kinds of, of things. Mm -hmm. So I think they are very <coughs> busy doing both. Do you think that there's anything um, besides fear that would have a, a country like the United States get um, unified in a vision? I hate to say it, I don't think so. I don't, I don't believe it. So, uh, what I thought when you were heading with your speech, I mean, it was kind of, you know, you were making the connection between the fear of the Soviet Union and yeah. it became obvious that you were yeah. talking about China pretty, yeah. pretty early. So, um, it's like, are you making your case for fear, like, to be afraid? And is yeah. that like... I think, yeah. <laughs> I think it is the best motive, it's the best kick in the ass that you can have. And it's a real fear, like the Soviet Union is yeah. a real fear. You have to have something that is of equal size and influence to the gravity of a situation to get people going. Otherwise, they mull around in the same same world and maybe turn a blind eye to it as well, but it doesn't affect me, I really don't care. You know, why should I? But I think, I think the, the larger the crisis, the more proactive. If you look at what, what is America, characterizes America probably more than anything, is its, its ability to, to probably react as to a crisis versus uh, execute advanced planning. Right. I think we have no skills, none, in executing advanced planning. But I think we have some skills, Katrina and other things aside, of trying, yeah, of trying to react uh, somewhat swiftly to a crisis. Um, you, in the exhibit hall, you've got a model of a big, low lunar yeah. colony. Yeah. How does this fit into all this? Because it seems like the way you're talking, 
that facility won't be able to be it's built because China, China will be, <laughs> you know, or you're going to sell to China. <laughs> we, we enjoy uh, working on future concepts of a lot of different things. Um, um, and I think you know, we have the Olympus, like the 2100, mm -hmm. it'll be an entire hospital, uh, space-based hospital, which you would need that kind of resource if you're doing a Mars mission and so on. So we have fun, uh, as we have for years, kicking this stuff around. So, you know, lo lo logically, um, our concepts apply to the moon and other places. Presenting this as here's a here's a way for us to get there and stake our claim for the Chinese. Well, city. yeah, some years ago, it, it just I, I was I was giving a, a briefing to somebody, um, and in, a senior senior person in, in NASA, and I said, you know, you're out of your mind doing any construction on a lunar surface. I've been I've been a contractor all my life, ever since I was two. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving little trucks around. <laughs> But I said, you know, I've never been on a construction site at nighttime when there weren't service trucks with all their lights on, servicing the damn cats and everything else, the, the, the blades and whatever we had there, grading. You can't be a quarter of a million friggin' miles away and have those kinds of problems. So really what you have to do is simplify and make it more elegant in, in the way of, of creating habitats. So the best way, actually, is to launch them to LEO, shove them into lunar orbit, and fill all the tanks up, and what, what was once a station lands as a base, and you have enough fuel to loiter and pick your site, which you've already pre-picked anyway, and secondary and tertiary sites, so you know where you're going. Uh, so you have a lot of fuel to loiter, and you may have enough fuel actually to leave the surface and go back up if there were ever a reason to do that. And so, so the idea of construction to me is, is a big mistake if you can avoid it. Then start using the, maybe the lava tubes and, and that sort of thing. Well, you know. that approach sounds like it would not create a whole lot of jobs for NASA contractors. <laughs> What and does? if you're doing construction on the moon, that creates, uh, I would think, create a lot of jobs. And your approach seems like it's a little bit easier, less you're, you're, you're intensive. You're going the wrong direction with jobs. Yeah. Jobs should be all about increasing the size of the pie. Not trying to figure out how how many more people can feed off the size of this one pie. Yeah. That's, that's the whole thing. It's really simple. Well, Increase it, the damn pies. Yeah, Not just the size of one, but all kinds of pies that never existed before. Yeah, I wasn't advocating and I was just kind of pointing out the political reality. Of yeah. The kind of person. yeah. I've heard that great story about Milton Friedman when he went to China and he was watching them. There was like this massive display of, of, like, of a construction project going on and just thousands of workers and he turned to the guy and said, uh, wow, you guys have a real labor problem. The Chinese officials, no, no, you know, we have full employment, this is awesome. And he said, well, then why aren't they using a spoon? <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask about the Genesis modules. Uh, sure. What's their status? Are, is, do you expect that they'll be still up there and is their emission control still up their there? Their life in orbit was about 12 years from the time that they reached orbit, thanks to our Russian friends, mm -hmm. uh, which we wouldn't have been able to orbit if we had to have them. Um, and uh, Genesis P1 was in 06 and G2 was 07. And they will re enter and burn up in 12 years from each of those dates, approximately. And we designed, um, we were hoping to get data for about six months. So we didn't um, go overboard in hardening a lot of the avionic systems and so forth, uh, our communication systems, uh, radiation wise. And we were really pleased that we got uninterrupted quality data for two and a half years. And after that time, some of our systems started to decay and go offline. Mm -hmm. And we track them uh, still today. We don't get much data back, but we still have our four communication stations, North Pole, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, Loring, Maine, and, and Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, we got some very valuable information that surprised us because the spacecraft performed really well. Mm -hmm. You're all using past tense, so you're no longer getting data? No. No. Okay. What, what is this? So we got everything we needed and more. We were just ecstatic about how they performed. What, you're what not going to find any more test modules before the actual operational I, one? You can, you, okay. can get, you can get really comfortable. Um, 
terrestrially, I think about 90% on almost anything you want to test. And you, there are so many different ways to test things, to test anything. But the actual, the last 10% is you better fly. And I think that's what Genesis 1 and 2 did for us. It gave us really good confidence in all of our seals, which is really important. Uh, window seals, uh, uh, airlock seals, or, or um, bulkhead seals. And um, we have really good data on the uh, protection ability of the, of the, uh, the shield itself. So we, we we're very happy. Well, what is the status of the uh, discussions with NASA about putting a module on station? Are you still discussing that, or, or um, that right now? We are. It, 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 there was kind of a come to Jesus realization recently uh, that we perceived in NASA. We kind of felt this for quite some time. In fact, I was um, all set and went to go see Charlie and and uh, had my little speech already, and I started to walk in, and, and he says, you know, we don't have nearly enough down destinations. The private sector isn't going to make it out of just four trips a year to the ISS. So I put my thing in my briefcase, because he's saying my speech now. So I'm just shut up and listen to him. And, you know, I said, yeah, you're right. You're right, sir. You know, uh, this is, this is uh, true. This yeah. is absolutely true. Uh, four can support one company, but you can't support two companies or two divisions of companies off of that. Mm -hmm. So you do have to. So you're putting out all this money to stimulate tr tr uh, taxi service. Uh, you don't want them to go broke or fade away because there aren't enough. There's not enough destinations. Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, that some of your potential customers have been hurt.